What is going on, investors? Hopefully, you guys are doing well out there. On today's show, I've got five different stocks in the payments slash fintech sector. We're going to look at Block. We're going to look at PayPal. We're going to look at SoFi. We're going to look at Visa and MasterCard. There are timestamps down below if you want to jump forward to all the different stocks that you like. We will be doing a broad overview of the financials, not necessarily a really in-depth financial overview because we are on the eve of earnings for all of these stocks, and I will give you the approximate dates of earnings as we go through the different stocks. Let's not waste any more of your time. We'll kick things off with Block Incorporated, otherwise known as Square. The ticker symbol is still SQ on this one. Now, the reason why we're looking at this one is this thing is down over 70% over the last year and year to date, it is down 54%. We still, despite that gigantic drop on this stock, we still have a premium valuation on this one. A price to earnings I'm seeing on this one, at least from a forward view, is still over 84 on a price to sales basis. Still rather rich when you factor in the market cap is still a gigantic $44 billion. I tell you what, folks, if you are in this one at a higher price, especially kind of north of $150 per share, this might be one of those cases where that share price and that valuation just simply never returns because a lot of stocks like this we're just so overhyped and so pumped up that it's going to be tough from an operation perspective to get back to that point. So if you're in this one for a higher price, kind of sucks. But if you've been on the sidelines with this one, it can create opportunities when you have this big of a drop. Now, they did report their previous earnings call back in August. We had a full video here on the channel. I'll have links down in the description below to all the full descriptions and the full earnings reports if you want to go back and review those. We will do a high-level overview of the revenue and the profits and the business segment and the trends at all of these companies, including Block. Now, revenue came in at $4.41 billion. That was actually a decline year over year on that revenue. We'll talk about some of the reasons why they had declining revenue year over year. It's a little tricky when it comes to Block because they have this massive Bitcoin revenue, which we talked about extensively here on the channel. The fact that this company essentially acts as a middleman when it comes to these Bitcoin transactions. But I'm assuming according to accounting rules, they actually have have to factor in that revenue dollar for dollar. So when you buy $1 of crypto using one of Block's platforms, they actually recognize that as $1 in revenue. But obviously they have to subtract the cost on that, which is very close to $1. It's a very low margin business. So when that revenue declined from $2.7 billion all the way down to $1.7 billion, a nearly $1 billion decline on the revenue side on that Bitcoin revenue, well, all of a sudden, and your comps year over year on those earnings and those revenue estimates certainly got blown up a little bit. Now, from a more normalized environment, from a crypto perspective, we might be able to better understand Block's growth patterns over the next several quarters. I'm looking at Wall Street estimates here for Block, and I'm seeing over the next, really the next year, Wall Street expecting to a mid to high teens grower getting to about $5.1 billion by the time we reach Q2 of next year. Now, what Wall Street has factored into this stock and I can buy into it a little bit is that it actually will reaccelerate into kind of a mid to low teens grower on that revenue side for the back half of 2023 and into 2024. Now, that makes a little bit of sense from an economic perspective because you potentially have a slowdown in economic activity, which will certainly hurt companies like payment processors and payment companies like Block, but then you might have a reacceleration towards the back half of next year or into 2024 where revenues start to pick up again. Now, what we talked about at the top was the massive valuation over at Block, and it is still, believe it or not, this thing is still wildly over Value. Now, it is difficult to value this one based on a like a price to sales because we talked about that Bitcoin revenue. They have to recognize it dollar for dollar. So I wouldn't necessarily look at this one from a price to sales basis. It's a little bit difficult from price to earnings as well, since this stock, like a lot of Jack Dorsey stocks, has excessive, in my opinion, excessive stock based compensation, excess, excessive stock dilution as well. That is going to impact stuff like EPS and earnings. 
So I don't necessarily even think you can look at this from an earnings per share basis as well. So one thing I brought up was price to cash flow because that does clean up a few things when it comes to price to operating cash flows. Now, unfortunately, we don't get a forward view into cash flows. We've got a trailing 12 month view. And over the last year, look, obviously, as the stock has been declining, the price to cash flow has been going down. But you are paying 60 times Folks, that means you're looking at a 60 forward multiple on those cash flows, or this happens to be trailing 12 months. But either way, that I don't care what company you're looking at, when the company has just kind of mid to high, even on the optimistic view, maybe mid 20s growth rate out into the future, still paying 60 times operating cash flows, not cheap at all. So despite the gigantic decline in this stock, 54% over the last year, 70% over the last year, and 54% down over the year to date, this stock is still overvalued. But there are some things to like here, okay? And then we'll get to this from a technical perspective. I think there are some things to like when we look at this technical pattern. So this is not going to be a complete bash on block, but here are some things that I noticed when I started to look at the segment revenues, because I think that's really what you need to do when it comes to block. We've obviously talked about Bitcoin. This is a low margin business. And obviously, if you have a reacceleration in crypto and the price of that or reaccelerates maybe back up over 30000 or 40000 uh, for a Bitcoin, well, that's certainly will be a tailwind for a company. Now, barring something like that happening, there obviously is some really nice business models that we really like on this company. Now, we have that Cash App. We have transaction-based revenue on Cash App. Now, the growth rate in that business is starting to slow. We see back in 2020, on a quarterly basis, you were at $53 million worth of revenue. That basically doubled to 110 in 2021. And now here we are in 2022. Notice, though, we went from 110 up to 116. So we're seeing a slowing of growth rate right there. In fact, I would say that Block's best growth rates are behind them. But we'll talk here in a minute of some ways they can maybe do some other things like SoFi has done to maybe reaccelerate some profits and opportunities to make money. Now, the Square business on that transaction side is still growing relatively nicely. But again, we went from 628 to 1.1 billion to 1.4 billion dollars. So you're seeing we doubled our revenues in the 2020-2021 period. That was when the stock just rocketed upwards. Wall Street rewarded it for this accelerating growth rate of these nice business models. Well, that is starting to come back down to a more normalized level in the most recent quarter and over the last six months as well. And so investors are paying the price that bought at those accelerated prices. But you also have the subscription-based revenue as well. On the cash app side, you went from 271 to 494 all the way up to 720. So you're actually still seeing pretty solid growth. It's not like 2020 to 2021, but it's still solid growth. And where you're seeing actually the best revenue growth is on the subscription side on Square. You went from 75 to 151. That's a double. You also doubled it again this year up to 317 million. So that is an accelerating business. You love to see that. So there's absolutely some things to like when it comes to Square. Now, from a broader view of their operating profits, our total net revenues came in at that 4.4 billion dollars that was down year over year from 4.6 or closer to 4.7 down to this 4.4. But we talked about their other business segments are still firing, I wouldn't say on all cylinders, but still doing nicely. Transaction-based revenue went from 1.2 to about 1.5. Subscription revenue still growing very rapidly from 685 million up to nearly 1.1 billion dollars. Hardware revenue, this is a loss leader category where they essentially sell this hardware to merchants essentially at a loss to drive this subscription and software revenue. Now, they also have that Bitcoin revenue, which was down basically a billion dollars year over year from 2.7 down to about $1.8 billion. Unfortunately for Block and unfortunately for a lot of Jack Dorsey led companies, there are just an excessive amount of cost at this company. It's essentially run for the benefit of the insiders, the executives, the employees, which look, if you work there or you're one of the executives here at 
at this company. It's fantastic for you. If you're a shareholder, obviously we've seen what happens there. So that's why you have to separate yourself when you're tuning in to the investor channel. This isn't the executive channel. This isn't the employees channel. You have to separate that mindset when you are an investor, because look at the total cost of revenue year over year went from 3.5 again, down to 2.9, but that doesn't paint the full story. Your transaction based costs, obviously going up with revenue from 682 up to 875, your subscription revenue from 120 to 213. That is still a fantastic business. This is what has me excited about this stock because we talked about the fastest growing business at this company that still maintains a very high growth rate is this subscription and service-based revenue, both on Square and at Cash App. That grew from 685 to $1.1 billion. Look at your total cost. I mean, they're almost non-existent. They went from 120 up to just $213 million. So your gross profits on that business are extraordinarily high. So if they can maintain, so when this company has their earnings and Block will record their earnings on November 9th, approximately, that date might change, but the first week or the second week of November, we should have Block earnings. What I am going to be paying a close attention to, and you as an investor should be paying close attention to, is this subscription and service base growth rate on that revenue side. And you can drill into this on the financials. It's deep in their financial statements. I mean, this is towards the bottom. In fact, the vast majority of great financial information is towards the bottom of the financial sheets. You're looking for this growth rate on this subscription service base to be growing on the cash up side and on the square side. You can get a broader view of it here as well on just kind of the normal profit and loss statement as well. You need, I repeat, you as an investor, if you're bullish this name, you need that growth rate to continue because that is by far, by far the highest margin business. You see this transaction-based revenue, you had $1.5 roughly billion dollars worth of revenue, you had $875 million worth of cost. Again, I would categorize that as still a pretty high margin business, not nearly as high as subscription. That's why we want this subscription revenue just to continue to grow and grow and grow. Now, you come down to hardware cost, they spent $83 million for just $48 million in business. That's why that is a loss leader. And then finally, on crypto, off of $1.8 billion worth of revenue, they had about $1.7 five billion dollars worth of cost. They squeeze out a profit there, but they're essentially just a middleman catching a small percentage of that. Obviously, if you get a reacceleration in crypto prices, can be very beneficial for this company. Now, gross profit year over year went from 1.1 billion down to roughly 1.5 billion dollars. That I would take as a positive because again, we had declining revenues year over year, but your gross profit actually expanded just a little bit. In fact, maybe a little bit more than a little bit. $300 million on $1.1 billion is actually a pretty significant growth rate. So I'm excited about that. But like I keep repeating myself, this is a Jack Dorsey led company. Unfortunately, we have operating expenses as well. And those ballooned from $1 billion all the way up to $1.7 billion. Folks, that is a 70% increase on those operating expenses that drove an operating income loss in the most recent period. It went from $125 million positive last year all the way down to a negative $213 million. Folks, this is what we saw for a decade over at Twitter. In fact, we're still seeing over at Twitter was it's not run very profitably from an operating expenses. Again, if you're an employee or an executive of this company and you're getting this share-based compensation and you're cashing that in, well, it's good for you. But notice the dilution that you're having at this company. This will be the opposite towards the tail end of this video. We'll look at Visa and MasterCard. They're reducing their number of shares outstanding through a buyback. Look at what Block did over the last year. They increased the number of shares outstanding by over 10%. It went from 522 up to 581. Again, that is a lot of dilution just on a quarterly basis year over year. Now, we are going to jump into the technical pattern over at Square. And I tell you what, this one's done something incredibly interesting. Now, the longer term trend on this stock, it's still what I would consider up, but I would wager that the vast majority 
majority of people that are tuning into this program didn't accumulate this stock from 2016 to 2018. And even if you did, you really would have had to accumulate this stock in 2016 and early 2017 to really have, I mean, that's still a pretty significant gain. If you bought this one south of, call it 30 bucks, you're still up, you know, 100% over the last couple of years. I, believe me, I would love to have owned this stock over that period of time. But vast majority of this stock was accumulated after 2018 and 2019, and a lot of it was accumulated at higher prices. So I would say the trend for this stock is actually flat for the intermediate term and the shorter term, it's absolutely fallen off a cliff. It is still, I repeat, this stock is still in this downward channel. In fact, the vast majority of stocks that we're looking at here in the channel, unless it's like in the energy space and maybe a handful of other stocks, when we look at Visa and MasterCard later in the show, their stock pattern is a little bit different, but most stocks that we're looking in is still in this downward channel. This one has not broken out of this. In fact, when we look at PayPal next, that one actually has broken out from this one. So it could be bullish four square in the shorter or longer term. One thing that I'm noticing though, in the very shorter term, we are making a series of higher lows here with this stock. So that is a positive sign, but we should re reach some resistance when we get to the top of this downward channel represented by this red line, the steep a downward channel red line. But we should also reach resistance with square also at this top green line. Okay, this acted as resistance for really over a year back here at the, about the low $80 range, $81, $82, $85 per share. Again, it acted as a little bit of support. The stock hesitated and wanted to hold this level back earlier this year. It has failed to do that. That level, I think both of these levels are going to be difficult for Square or Block to get through. It's going to be tough, in my opinion, to blast over this red trend line. And it's going to converge, even if it does get over that, at a, another a level of resistance where sellers will likely step in at about $85 per share. If you are bullish this name and you don't mind the premium valuation that you're still continuing to pay and you believe in the tailwinds, the two tailwinds for this stock is crypto makes a nice comeback. The Actually, there's three tailwinds. That crypto comes back and the demand, first of all, stays where it's at and accelerates, not necessarily in the shorter term, but maybe over the next 20 24 months, you get a nice little bull run at some point for crypto, maybe a rising 20, 30%. It's a volatile asset. So that's certainly possible. The other bull case scenario is the subscription revenue just keeps doubling or almost doubling. If you can maintain that type of growth rate on this subscription business, I showed you the gross margins and likely the gross profits off a business like that. That is fantastic. Now the third tailwind this company continues to add on services. We'll talk about SoFi later in this show. That company became a bank holding company. Block certainly has its the ability to either go out and get a bank charter one by one or going the SoFi route and finding a quote unquote smaller bank to acquire. And then as you acquire that bank, now you have access to that bank charter. What that bank charter allows you to do is actually take deposits from customers and then lend that out. And in the case of Block, they have so many corporate, or I think a better way to say that is they have so many small business clients that could want to have deposits on with this company, maybe have other lending products that they can develop that could be bullish for Block in the longer run. But again, we're kind of talking about hopes and dreams when it comes to stuff like this. I would expect this stock to reach some resistance about $10 higher. You get a pullback. I it wouldn't be the worst decision an investor makes if they buy this one back on the pullbacks. Either we get a pullback, this upper trend line, these higher lows maintain, and you come up here to some area of resistance, and then you pull back, maybe back to $68, $69 per share. You get a deeper pullback down here to about $60 per share. That could be a buying opportunity, but I would set a stop loss underneath a stock like this because if you fall through this $60 level on on this stock, while well, much, much lower prices could materialize very, very quickly, just like when we broke through this $190 level back in December of 2021, well, it was look out below. Similar type of thing could materialize considering this stock is still wildly overvalued from a traditional financial metrics perspective. The last point I'm going to make with Block, and this applies for almost all of these stocks other than Visa and MasterCard, is this would not be a traditional buy and hold stock. I would take profits on 
this one, at least for a portion of my position. If I were to say buy, uh, you know, 100 shares of this company, if I was fortunate to time it right and the stock reverses and it starts to go up, I wouldn't necessarily want to sell all my 100 shares, but I would, I would take profits on at least a percentage of those shares because of Jack Dorsey's inability to run companies from an operating profit perspective. They are run for the benefit of the executives, run for the benefit of the employees and not the shareholders until he changes his ways, which he has never proven himself as an executive that he's able to do that. Until he does that, this would just be a speculative stock. It would be a minor portion of my portfolio and I would absolutely take profits on this one at even a small percentage game because that's exactly what the company is doing with the shares as well. Next company that we're going to look at today is PayPal. Now, over the last year, this one's also down big, over 66%. Year to date, down about 50%. We still have a pretty gigantic market cap on this one, up over $111 billion. But when you look forward on this one, not wildly overvalued, certainly compared to where it's been in the past, you've only got a 24 PE on this one. Now, for some investors, a 24 P is still wildly overvalued, but this company still has a relatively respectable revenue growth rate and certainly on the earning side as well. It's essentially matching that as well. And then when we come over here and look at the financials, you are seeing some financial discipline that lacks like maybe in a block and maybe even like a SoFi as well. There is some financial discipline when it comes to PayPal. This company also likely going to try to reaccelerate revenues at some point through some kind of acquisition. They've been rumored in the past to maybe want to get into the social ad space with the purchase of a Pinterest. I think there's some ways that PayPal can grow through acquisition in the future. That certainly can provide some upside with the stock as well. Now, when we take a look at the revenue estimates for the next couple of quarters, this one has been pegged as kind of a mid-teens grower out into infinity by Wall Street. So when you factor in kind of a mid-teens grower for the next four quarters, you're getting to about a 24 forward P on this one. Again, that is going to scare some investors, but it will get some investors excited considering the fact this stock has traded much, much higher than that. Now we'll get into the most recent earnings, but like most of these stocks, I've done a more detailed analysis of the balance sheet, the cash flows and other types of things. I'll include a link to that in the description below, but I do want to give you a high level overview of their last quarter, which they reported just a couple of months ago. Now, PayPal, we should get earnings from them in the month of October. We should get it about the third week of October. Right now, tentatively, the date of earnings for PayPal is October 20th. So we will get an update to these earnings. And I'll talk about some of the things that I'll be watching for when the company actually reports their next earnings. But I first want to get into the revenues. Decent revenue growth year over year on a quarterly basis from 6.2 billion up to 6.8. And again, Wall Street expecting essentially kind of mid-teens grower. We're expecting in the upcoming quarter about $6.8 billion worth of revenue. Quarter over quarter, essentially flat, but that will be a little bit of acceleration over the previous year at about 10 10.4% growth year over year. And then for the next four quarters, you're going to be a shade over $7 billion, actually closer to $8 billion on that revenue side. The company has done a nice job controlling their expenses, okay? As opposed to Block, which we just looked at, this company actually did a nice job year over year controlling their operating expenses from 5.1 up to just $6 billion, including general administrative actually going down year over year. I thought this was interesting. Their sales and marketing spend actually went down year over year from 628 down to 595. That is good, in my opinion, as well, getting a little bit more organic revenue growth over at this company instead of maybe doing a lot of incentives or a lot of advertising. I really like that as as well. Now, what hurt this company from an operating perspective, because what you're going to notice is yes, operating expenses went up and they went up in excess of our total net revenues. We went from 6.2 up to about 6.8 and our operating expenses accelerated a little bit more than that. You went from 5.1 to $6 billion. So that certainly contributed to the operating income actually declining year over year from 1.1 billion down to $764 million. What we saw was an acceleration of transaction and credit losses. So this company does have exposure to those credit losses. And you see here just 170 million last year on a quarterly basis, all the way up to $448 million. Folks, that almost cancels out all of your net revenue gains. So if we get into a rough patch with the economy and certainly compared to a year ago, 
ago and even two years ago, transaction and credit losses were artificially low because, you know, every federal government and Federal Reserve Bank out there was just raining helicopter money down on the citizens and people, you know, were able to pay their bills. Obviously, that has tightened up over the last six months. I don't need to tell anybody that, but certainly I think it will continue to tighten and so we could see and a continued acceleration of these credit losses. How bad they get certainly could impact this company absolutely from a financial perspective. Now, from a share buyback perspective, this company actually is on the side of retiring shares. You notice a year over year, you had 1.186 outstanding shares. That declined to 1.158. So they are buying back shares over at PayPal. One use of the cash. I personally would rather this company maybe retain that money and then go out and grow through acquisition. That is how this company is going to be able to reaccelerate this growth rate. That's how you're going to be able to reaccelerate a premium valuation on this company. Those are certainly probably your two ways that you really get a tailwind behind PayPal is that, yes, maybe we're in an economic slowdown. Maybe it lasts into next year, maybe early next year, but it starts to dissipate maybe in the spring or the early part of next year. And then the second half looks really good. Certainly could be bullish for PayPal. The other thing, obviously, some kind of acquisition. When you have stocks in this sector down 50, 60, 70%, a company like this could leverage its $100 billion valuation and combine with another company, and then all of a sudden grow revenues in that sense. Now, from a technical perspective, this one is actually interesting, okay? Almost identical chart to block, okay? This stock, if you accumulated it back in 2015, 2016, you still have relatively strong gains on this one, but the vast majority of investors have accumulated this stock likely just over the last 12 months or so, or the last 24 months, and the vast majority of those investors will be underwater to a certain degree, certainly some tremendously underwater. But there are some signs of hope from a technical perspective, like a lot of stocks that we're looking at, they're in these downward channels. I mean, this downward channel, you could extend it all the way up here. This thing is steep, but we finally broke out. Look what we just did more recently. We'll zoom into this price action because this actually is kind of exciting. We actually broke out to the top of that. We have some level of support down here at about 90. We're looking for this one to break above this level. It's going to be tough psychologically and from just a technical resistance place as $100 per share, but you're looking for green candles over $100 per share. If you get over $100 per share, momentum could easily take you back up to 124 on this one. So I'm excited about this one. I think in the shorter term, a couple things could happen with PayPal. If the overall economy is a little rough and the market takes another leg down, well, this one I think is coming back and is at least going to back test this downward trend line. That actually would not alarm me one bit, and that would be the first area that I would really highly consider to buy PayPal, is a back test onto this channel. And depending on how quickly it goes, obviously if it happens tomorrow, it's dumping all the way down here at about $75 per share. But if it takes a while, it probably won't get all the way back there. But you get back into this green box between $70 and $90 per share, don't mind a purchase on this one as well. The other thing that could happen is we do have, there is a level of support on the top of this green box that I have here. There is a level of support right here at about $90 per share. Again, only $6 lower than where the stock is today. But what is that, like a 5% move down? A 5% move down, I think you could potentially start a position in this. When I say you could potentially start a position in this stock, that's if you want, let, let's use an easy number. You want 10 shares of this one, one share, two shares at that point, and you wait to see what happens. Because if you do lose momentum down below 90, while well, your retesting area is probably south of 80, you want to make sure you still have an, enough ammunition to add and dollar cost average into that stock if that makes that move. The more exciting thing to me is, yes, you could accumulate here at 90, but I actually like the breakout on this one. If you can get this one on a breakout, get above this $100 level, I wouldn't necessarily jump into it because I think you could put a couple green candles up here, momentum's there, but then the sellers were to emerge. Then I think you back test back to a hundred. That could be an exciting area as well. Again, these are disciplined purchases, newer investors, more uh, retail focused investors, not necessarily will have this type of discipline. So what I'm describing to you is essentially like textbook discipline into trying to accumulate a stock. You're looking for a back test to 90, a back test to this trend line, 
or a breakout back test to 100, that would create a series of higher lows and tell me that the momentum is probably taking you eventually back up to 124. Folks, a move from 100 to 124, I don't need to tell anybody out there, is a 25% move and I think that could happen in a very short period of time, like over the course of 12 months. If you make 20% on a stock over 12 months, you pat yourself on the back and like Block and like SoFi, I would take profits in PayPal. In my opinion, this is not a long-term buy and hold company. You look at the history of the stock chart. It is wildly volatile. I don't need to tell anybody that. And from a price to sales and a price to earnings perspective, even if this company maintains and reaches its targets by Wall Street, still not a cheap stock by any sort. And so if you can get a 20%, even a 10% gain in the stock in the shorter term, I would at least take some chips off the table. So if I own 10 shares, I'd probably take at least three, four, five of them off the table once it reaches a target level. Should be significant resistance at the 123 level, but from the shorter term, this stock is actually broken out of this downward trend line. And this is bullish, not only for PayPal, but for a lot of stocks out there, because again, this stock is not wildly undervalued. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that one. Next stock that we'll look at here on the channel, probably one of the lowest from a just a, an absolute share price. I personally don't buy stocks or don't actively buy stocks, essentially, really from a long-term perspective, certainly from a trading perspective, stocks under $10 do have a little bit of alert to them, but I would not buy and hold a $6 stock. We'll just start it off like that because over the last year, this thing's down 59% year to date, basically down 59%. We got a $5.8 billion valuation on this one. That's where this one gets a little exciting because as we go through this financials, as we go through the revenue growth drivers at this company, there are a lot of things to like about this company, but can it really accelerate up back? I mean, this stock was well over, you know, a 10, $12 billion company at some point, even higher than that. My opinion is it's going to be tough to get back to those days because there are some things going on from a fundamental perspective. We'll talk about those. Now, we do have some positive news. Obviously, just a couple of weeks ago, President Biden announced a $10,000 student loan forgiveness plan. This helps ZoFly since they've been carrying some of these student loans that uh, these students haven't been required to pay back. Now, the United States taxpayer is going to reach into their pocket and pay off this $10,000 student loan. Now, obviously, from a political perspective or a social perspective, you could have arguments for or against that, but this isn't the political science channel. This is the investor channel, and this is great for SoFi, and the stock reacted positively to that. But what we've talked about here on the channel is this company is still in fundraising mode, and when your stock is a, like a 6 or $7 stock, and it's down 60% over the last year, that is still going to create a lot of pressure on the stock. Now, a block of SoFi shares are reportedly being offered by major investment banks at $6.10 per share. Folks, this was just back in August 24th, so just a couple of weeks ago. These are large institutional investors, and this was a, a nearly $30 million block of shares that were priced essentially under the market and certainly under where the shares are today. This happens a lot with these more speculative companies, and this is one of the risks with these companies. This is why I always, always, always recommend taking profits on these types of stocks because look, folks, the big smart money, quote unquote, smart money institutional investors are taking their profits as well. That might be selling at a loss. Now, we also have SoftBank as well. And it could be that those shares were SoftBanks. I don't know. We've got August 8th. They talked about how they're going to start selling off their SoFi shares. Now, this is a major investor, okay? They have $83 million worth of SoFi shares. This is, no, excuse me, 83 million shares. Okay, times $6 per share. This is a 9% stake of the company. They started peeling off their shares back in August. They started at $7.99. They sold some more at about $8 per share. This is going to create an overhang on the stock if SoftBank continues to unload those 83 million shares. And if this isn't SoFi, when it comes to this more or less private offering at $6.10, well, now you've got other investors that are trying to unload these shares as well. Very complicated situation. But some things to like, obviously, about this company is you've got this massive revenue growth rate. Now, some of this is not comparable because we'll talk about it here when we get 
over to the financials. We'll blow these up just a little bit. We'll talk about how this company is transforming their business. Over the last year, they bought a bank charter. I think they bought a bank like in Utah that had a nationwide bank charter. What this is allowing SoFi to do in the past, all they would do would be originate loan and sell the loans. And that's a good business. That's a decent business. That's a business that has a lot of margin of safety. If you're originating loans and you have a buyer, a, a larger investment bank on the other end to buy those loans, but it's not a high margin business. And it's not the business that the Bank of America and the JP Morgans have basically been bread and buttering for the last uh, you know four or five decades, or maybe even longer than that. Where you make money as a financial institution in particular is primarily through accepting deposits. So your customers depositing their paychecks and then you pay a small amount of interest or in SoFi's case, it's actually probably above market average interest rate. And then you take that and then you go give car loans or you go give business loans or you go give mortgage or student loans. And you obviously charge a premium for the interest on those types of things. And obviously, if we are anticipating a higher interest rate environment over the next couple of years, maybe potentially, maybe even longer than that, maybe we're in for a generation of quote unquote higher rates or higher than normal rates that we've seen over the last decade or two. Certainly bullish for a company like this. So some of these revenue growth comparisons, not really comparable, okay? Because again, over the last year, this company acquired that bank charter that has bolstered up this company's revenue generation machine. And you see over the next couple of quarters, you're comping against a SoFi that didn't have that bank charter. So yes, you will have 40% growth, 50% growth, 47% revenue growth, 34% revenue growth over the next several quarters. And it does extend out into essentially all the way into next year. You're growing north of 35% on this company for the next couple of quarters. Again, this is just according to a couple of analysts though, okay? So I wouldn't be looking at these numbers like it's factual information, but these analysts, you know, look, they, they do make money for a reason. But when we get out into 2024, that's when it, it becomes more difficult for this company. They're gonna have to acquire even more deposits over at their banking product. And obviously they're gonna have to loan that out successfully to customers. So the growth rate towards the first half of 2024 will likely slow, but it's still rather significant, especially when you compare it to other more traditional financial institutions like a Bank of America, like a JP Morgan, even like a Wells Fargo. Now, when we come over and look at these financials, we see the explosive growth that this company has able to generate over the last year. Net interest income. This is essentially, again, the company taking deposits from, uh, you know, checking accounts and then loaning those out for student loan, car loans, home loans, those types of things, personal loans, look at the income over the last year. It went from 56 all the way up to 122. I'm very, very excited about that. The non-interest income, which again is more fees and kind of originating loans and then selling them, packaging them up and then selling to other financial institutions, that's still growing as well, okay? It went from 231 up to 362. And the reason why it's exciting that this company is pivoting their business is look at the non-interest expense, okay? It went from 396 up to 458. So you still have ex excessive non-interest expense, especially when you compare it just to the non-interest income, which again, is still growing, but it's not rapidly growing by the, like the net interest income and the company originated loans and, and retaining those on the balance sheet and essentially into maturity or for a period of time. That is leading to net losses over at this company. 165 million last year, 95 million on a quarterly basis. That's 12 cents per share. The other thing that you have at this company that is impacting the stock price, you not only have insiders like SoftBank selling, you have other maybe institutional banks as well selling or institutional investors selling large blocks of shares. Well, look at the, what the company is doing to their share count as well. Went from 365 million all the way up to 910 million. That is almost triple. I mean, you're talking almost a 300% increase on the number of shares outstanding that is contributing to the fact that this stock has literally fallen off a cliff and it's just a disaster. But there are some things to like. Now, we will have earnings over at SoFi sometime the first week of November. I have tentatively November 9th as the first week where we get some earnings. Now, we'll forget it. Look, if you bought this stock higher than 10, 12, 15, heaven forbid, you bought this stock over $20 per share, forget about it. I don't think you're going to see 
those share prices anytime soon. It'd be really surprising because again, this company is pivoting their business, but now they're pivoting their business to compete against JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and JP Morgan. So have fun, you know, competing against those companies with that kind of book of business. They still will do okay. What we are seeing though, from a technical perspective, I am in love with what we are seeing. And we, I think we made note of this on the last earnings call. We talked about there were, there are trading opportunities with SoFi and that's how I view this stock. The fundamentals look okay. The growth rate looks spectacular, but we're pivoting into a business with far more competition and you have major shareholders of this company actually looking to get out. So obviously they believe potentially the best days are, are over for this company as well. But from a technical perspective, we're making a beautiful, I'm talking about a beautiful set of higher lows. Back in May, we bottomed here. Back in July, we bottomed here. And back in September, just a week ago, we bottomed here at 575. We are confirming that. What you want to see with higher lows doesn't have to be, but from a perfect technical perspective, you want to confirm that with a series of higher highs. And that's exactly what we did back in May and also back in August. Folks, you could buy this one. Wouldn't be the low of the sideways consolidation. But if this pattern continues, even here at 635, if this pattern continues and we make higher highs, which would take us again over this cluster of highs at about, call that about $8.40. It doesn't have to get much higher. It could come right here at about $8.65, maybe even only $8.50. That would still confirm, folks, from $6.30 to $8.65. I can't do the math, but that is a tremendous gain and that could happen in the shorter term. So I like this one from a trade perspective, the momentum in this one. I would have a stop loss if I bought it here at 633. I, I think your low end of the stop loss is probably the previous lows here. So your previous lows are down here at about 525, just to give you kind of a round number. Now it's a higher risk, higher reward type trade, okay? From 627 down to 525, that that's a pretty big loss. But again, you're playing this one to go at least to these highs. Maybe it doesn't get all the way and make higher highs and confirm that. But even if it doesn't, if it gets, stops a little short, I'd probably start peeling my shares off right here at about 750, okay? That's still a dollar 40 upside with about a dollar downside. Not quite the risk reward I want. So I would probably bump my stop loss up on this one. I'd have it here probably at about 590. You could even maybe bump it all the way up to $6 even just understand at six dollars even 590 anywhere over this trend line the odds of you getting stopped out are actually relatively high but there the risk reward in my opinion really plays out on this one okay you've got two dollars plus an upside and just 30 cents of downside i love that risk reward just make sure if you play this shorter term trade, you play it like a shorter term trade because if the momentum falls out of this stock, if SoftBank says we're selling all 80 million shares that we have left, if another institutional investor comes along and sells their shares, if there's negative action in this market, a $6 stock is going to get obliterated. So make sure you have your stop loss, but also make sure you sell this one if the momentum stays in it because if you get up, if and when you get up here to 758, 850 dollars per share. We are absolutely expecting SoftBank and a bunch of other sellers to materialize in this stock and come back down here and retest areas south of 650. So you have to take profits on this one. I would put SoFi in the trading category. This is a speculative stock. It would not be one. I look for a buy and hold opportunity. Any stock under $10 in this market. Look, when I first started investing, it was any stock under a dollar. Then I think it went to about $5 per share. Now look with inflation, it's stocks under $10. I didn't even look at it. In fact, I don't think I've bought a stock under $100 in a, in a really long time. That's just where the market is right now. That's what I see with SoFi. There are certainly some things to like, but again, this is a speculative stock. It'd be a trading stock. I think you can make money on this one. Just make sure, make sure you take your profits. Now, we are going to look at Visa. This is probably one stock where if you don't want to take profits, if you're too lazy to do that, if you want to buy and hold investment, the last two stocks that I'm going to talk about on today's show are absolutely your 100% game changer winners when it comes to a buy and hold perspective. Because look at how these stocks have held up over the last year. We'll start with Visa over the last year, down just 9.8%. That might be beating the markets, okay? Because I think most of the markets are down year to date. This stock is down just 7.3%. 
percent and you're getting a little bit of yield not a lot you're getting 0.73 percent on this one again depending on what price you bought it at so that cancels out a little bit of those losses but this stock obviously with most of the markets or i think all the broader markets outside of the energy market essentially being down year to date a stock just being down 7.3 percent obviously holding up very nicely now u.s payment volumes climbed 11 percent year over year in august and that's kind of a no does situation because what was inflation year over year in august i would guess i i'm sure the government reported it somewhere in that kind of like eight to nine percent range somewhere in that range uh well my guess is probably a little bit higher than that but that is why visa is a powerful stock in an inflationary environment and in an environment where you might have a little bit of a slowdown followed by an economic recovery. Okay, this is maybe one of the perfect stocks for this. Again, not something that I would, you know, outpace my portfolio when it comes to Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft, because in that environment, stocks like that probably are going to do as good or better. But a stock like this will do well, obviously, in an inflationary environment. It's proving itself, but also an environment where you have a little bit of recovery. And we're seeing when it comes to analyst estimates, they are maybe projecting a little bit of an economic recovery. Over the next couple of quarters, they're still projecting strong revenue growth. 15% for the upcoming quarter, expected to get to about $7.6 billion. Next quarter, Q1, essentially, you're looking at $7.8 billion. And then you're looking at basically a 13% grower. They're out into 2024. Now, now, when it comes to valuation over at Visa, this has always been an expensive stock, okay? Hasn't been public for that long, but from a price to earnings, price to sales basis, it's always been a premium to the market. And some of that, I think, has to do with the fact that it does well in an inflationary environment, and it does well in an environment where you see a recovery. And then also... It can do well kind of in a bad environment, okay? Because people are putting purchases on, on credit cards, okay? And it doesn't carry a lot of the credit risk that a bank or another financial institution might have to carry. Now, we've seen the valuation, though, pull back on this one. I've got a five-year price to sales on this one. We've got about a 15 times price to sales on this one. That is, uh, you know, almost a two-year low on this one. In fact, when you get down to about 14 times sales over the last five years, that is when the buyers pretty aggressively stepped in. Obviously, towards the tail end of the March lows that we have in 2020, it bottomed out just right at about 12.5 times sales. We're not that much higher than that. I would say the outlook for the economy, just, you know, minus stimulus checks and PPP loans, which were obviously extraordinary for stocks and including Visa, minus that happening, still pretty good valuation on this one. Now, from a fundamental perspective, looks pretty good. Down in the link description, I'll have, I think I did a video on Visa this most recent quarter, but we'll look at the revenues. That's really what you need to focus on with this company. They have a major buyback. They have cash. From a cash flow perspective, everything looks gorgeous from everything that you look at. And so you really just need to focus on net revenues and really growth over at this company. From $6.1 billion up to about, we'll call that $7.3 billion. They did a nice job controlling their operating expenses year over year, up from $2 billion up to 3.1 your operating income went from 4 billion up to 4.1 so the, that's pretty good one of the reasons some investors ask me why i often just stop at uh, operating income here on the channel you could come down to net income some investors like really bring up earnings per share and those types of things one of the reasons why i don't look at earnings per share is this company is accelerating their buyback and so this company could earn more on a per share basis despite producing less earnings so that's one of the reasons why i don't don't pull all the way down to earnings per share is because that can be a manipulated artificially by a buyback. This is why we, when we look at Apple, when we look at Google, when we look at Microsoft, these companies have gigantic buybacks. Okay. So I don't really care about earnings per share because they're going to grow that no matter what, when they're buying back the shares, I tend to stop at operating income. The other reason why I stop at operating income is you have these pesky things called income taxes that uh, corporates and uh, most companies have to to pay. And notice last year they had $1.8 billion on that for some reason, despite higher revenue, higher operating income, they had to pay less income taxes. This is, uh, you know, why you have CPAs and you have tax attorneys out there. They obviously have a good one over at Visa because again, higher profits, higher revenues, and they had $1.4 billion worth of less, less income taxes. So despite pretty good revenue growth, 
basically flat from a rounding perspective. You went from call that 4.1 from a rounding perspective up to close to 4.2 on an operating perspective. Well, your net income ballooned. It went from 2.5 all the way up to 3.4 again, because you paid $1.4 billion less in income taxes. Again, likely due to the mix of revenue that this company had, they probably had a transaction that they had to pay a larger amount of taxes on last year that didn't reoccur in the most recent quarter or look, I don't know how these taxes work. That is why from an investor, I would just make it simple on yourself and stop at operating income. You don't miss out on a lot by not pulling down to net income because the vast majority of investors, especially serious ones, the institutional investors out there that are really driving kind of the volume and the payment flow into a stock like this, that this is what they're going to focus on. They're going to focus on the operations of this company. They're going to give them a pass on income taxes because they know in two years or six years or eight years, you're going to have a change of an administration at some point that might be able to run on lower taxes and pass that. And then all of a sudden that is a gigantic tailwind for a company like this. Now, from a technical perspective, this one looks kind of interesting. Now we do have earnings estimate date on Visa coming up on October 26th. So a little over a month away, should get that the third week of October. This one's doing something really interesting. Okay, you have this, I mean, this stock chart is just gigantic up. It started to sideways consolidate, okay? We have an area right here at about 190, only about $15 lower than where the stock is. Now, what we've done more recently, though, is we've made lower set of highs and we're making lower set of lows. Now, more recently, though, we've kind of bounced off this area down at 190 and then we took a pit stop here at 198 and then we're bouncing back up here. So the exciting thing for anybody that holds Visa stock will retest. I think we're a high probability. We retest back up here to 210, 215. Again, we'll probably do this maybe next week if the momentum stays in the markets and this stock. What you're looking for with Visa is you need to get above this cluster of highs. That will cancel out the lower highs that we're making, if we can finally get above this level at 215, that will cancel that out. That'll show me that there are buyers in this stock. We should get rejected either there at 220 or maybe a little higher. You retest these highs back up here at 230. You could get rejected here. Either way, you are likely to get rejected potentially back down to, the, I'm going to change this to a purple line just so we can have some clear understanding of what's going on here. This could potentially be the bottom back here in June, could potentially be the bottom. And if it is, we should get rejected again at 220 or 230, and we should pull back to this trend line. That should take us back down south, quite frankly, where the stock is today. So if you want to open up a trade on this one on Monday, wouldn't really bother me. Okay. I wouldn't, if you wanted a hundred shares of this, I wouldn't buy all 100 on one day because we could get rejected and come all the way back down here to 190. That would be a more exciting place for me, especially if you break these highs up here. Because again, that is showing me that this trend that we're in is over because the risk with a stock like this is this trend stays intact. All of a sudden the buyers dry up and then guess what happens? You pull a PayPal, you pull a SoFi, you pull a Block and you dump out the bottom, okay? Pull up a chart of Intel. There's a number of charts out there where a stock's been on sideways consolidation for a long time. And even in the case of Intel, wasn't wildly overvalued and has a really high dividend yield. And then it, boom, dumps out the bottom. You would not want that to happen with Visa because if you dump out on the bottom on this one, you're coming very quickly south of 175. So that's your risk with this one. If you are uncomfortable with that risk, you can set a stop loss somewhere in this 185, 188 region. There's a level lower at about 180 that I would have a stop loss. Again, if you don't want to lose your principal, have that risk of dumping out the bottom. I think the trends with the overall market probably has this one breaking these highs at 215, retracing to an area where we're at now. And we eventually continue some kind of, I think we're going to in an era where this stock probably just sideways consolidates. I don't necessarily see us retesting these highs back up here at 250 anytime soon. That would be well north of a 20 or 30% growth rate on this one in the shorter term. I think what you have here is a consolidation area and it might trend up a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be a V shape or a steady recovery. I think you're going to accumulate this sock south of $200 per share 
and you will have a nice longer term investment with this one. Finally, the last stock on our fintech and payment processor show is MasterCard. Now, I don't think I did a full overview of this stock the last time they reported earnings. Their next earnings call should be the first week, and I actually have it the first day of November. So we're looking at 11-1. We should get earnings from MasterCard. Again, that's an approximate date, but usually they're accurate within that week. So you should get it the first week of November. Over the last year, stocks performed beautifully. It is down 4.4%, but compared to a lot of stocks, that is fantastic. And over year to date, you're down about 9.4%. You don't get as strong of a yield as you do with Visa on this one. I would a tandem these two stocks, me personally. You could throw in American Express, and there's some other stocks out there that if you wanted to, American Express is not a stock I've looked into more recently, but I, I certainly see uh, a portfolio where you could add all those stocks as kind of your buy and hold type investment. Now, Drew's credit card data shows no recession, but cracks are starting to emerge. Obviously, people are starting to pile up more money on their credit cards. Now, it remains to be seen if consumers are piling up more credit card debt because of inflation or because they are actually just struggling to pay their bills. And if inflation retreats or at least stabilizes and we don't have these massive like 10% year over year increases on things like gas is way up more than 10% year over year. But broadly, prices are up year over year if that were to start to flatten out and you couple that with people maybe getting jobs or maybe getting a slight raise, maybe the cracks don't turn into gigantic kind of Grand Canyon-like gaps in the economy. That is the risk, obviously, not breaking any news with all of these stocks, but the broader market in general is these cracks turn into gigantic recessions and gigantic pullbacks. We'll see what happens with that. Now, this company, just like Visa, looking at kind of a mid-teens grower out into infinity, that what has that's what Wall Street has for this one. From a price to sales basis, very much like Visa as well. These two, the two stocks trade in tandem. In my opinion, from a valuation perspective, you're at about 15 times forward sale, or this is trailing 12 month sales on MasterCard. That's almost exactly where Visa is. That is why when one of these stocks have a little bit of weakness, I tend to add to that stock and let the other one run. And then when the other one pulls back, I tend to add just small amounts to this. Again, I'm not trying to center my portfolio. I'm not trying to have more MasterCard or Visa than Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, or even Tesla. Now you construct your portfolio how you like. If you're closer to retirement, if you're closer to a more conservative investor, you're not really focused on growth. I tell you what, stocks that are only down 9% year to date and give you the upside of a recovery because you stretch this stock out to five years and you're up 135%. So you have that downside protection with a MasterCard and you have that upside gain with this stock. That's why I like these stocks. That's why I think these stocks belong in all investors portfolio, but depending on your age and your risk level, it could be a lot of Visa and MasterCard, and it could be a little bit. For me, it's kind of, it's below the te the profitable mega cap tax, but it's certainly above a lot of the, almost every other stock out there as well. Now, some other things that we'll look at, again, I showed you the price of sales at a, oh, not at a five-year low, but it's very close. This is where investors tend to accumulate this. Now, from a high-level financial overview, nice solid earnings year over year, almost bolted on, not quite, but close to a billion dollars worth of revenue, went from 4.5 up to about 5.5. They did a nice job controlling operating expenses. You went from 2.2 up to about 2.5. That drove higher operating incomes at this company from 2.3 up to $3 billion. If you want to flow all the way down to net income, which I explained on the visa video. I don't normally do. You don't necessarily have to, but you had higher net income as well. You also have higher earnings per share. Some of that, obviously most of that driven by higher net income and higher operating income and higher revenues. But some of that also do the fact that you have a buyback as well. You had 994 diluted shares outstanding last year down to 974. Again, I think that's in thousands or that's in millions. So there's more than 974 shares. There's 974 million. You get the idea. We're buying back the shares at MasterCard. Again, this is why I would favor this stock as well. Now, the technical pattern on this one is exactly the same as Visa. That's why I love both of these companies. It's actually a shortcut for you, the investor. You really only need to understand one or kind of understand both 
and they both perform identically. So when one does something, the other one's probably going to do it. Occasionally they, they diverge and one is outperforming the other one. That's why I would favor like MasterCard if Visa's run a little bit and vice versa. This one's making a series of lower highs, but more shorter term. There is certainly evidence that maybe we've bottomed or at least starting to make some higher lows on this one. The bottom of the range is close to 312. I think you could extend that maybe not 10%, but about 5%. I think you could buy this if you wanted to open up a trade on this one on Monday or early next week at the 335 level. Wouldn't be the worst spot. Wouldn't be the greatest or the cheapest spot over the last several years, but wouldn't be a bad spot. Because you do have upside. If the if these continue, these higher lows materialize, we should get to at least 350 on this stock. That's $15 in upside on this one. What you want is for this one to break above 360. Now, a break above 360 will likely followed by selling pressure back to either the bottom of the range down here at 313 or back to this purple line. And depending on how quickly it gets there, could be, quite frankly, right about 335. Now, the thing to understand about MasterCard and Visa as well is there is a lid on this stock. This is also why I would favor, if I'm building a portfolio for growth and for the long term, I still favor the Apples, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, and even the Teslas. Because the lid on those companies is, is there, but it's probably a heck of a lot higher than a stock like this. The lid on MasterCard is at 390. I would not, I repeat, I would not blame an investor if they bought here at 350. 35, 340, even 350, and they decided to take profits up here. Maybe not on all the shares, but they decided to take some profits and allocate that into another stock. Wouldn't have a problem with that at all because I, I don't necessarily know what pushes us up above all-time highs on MasterCard and Visa. That isn't good for almost every other stock out there. So if we push to all-time highs on MasterCard, Quite frankly, I'd probably rather be on a stock, maybe even like a PayPal, a SoFi, and a Block, that is probably going to have higher beta and higher volatility to the upside to capture more of those wins. If you're just a straight buy and hold investor, well, the chart pattern doesn't get much better than this. I mean, this is like a straight arrow up and the way this business model is and the competitive environment and the lack of competitors in an environment like this, certainly bullish for this. So I wouldn't blame an investor just kind of buying and holding this one, but at the same time, understand that your upside is capped to a certain degree, at least in the shorter term, longer term, these stocks with the buybacks, the dividends, and the trends in the economy likely going to be pretty good bets over the longer term. That was the FinTech show for Sunday. Hopefully, guys, enjoyed today's video. We'll be back again soon with more videos. Obviously, we're still about a month away from earnings, and that's when things really pick up here on the channel, but we'll fill things in with uh, several videos like this over the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, you guys, have a wonderful week. We'll see you again soon. Good luck with your investments.